The title of my talk is Understanding the Bone Origins and Bone Effects, the tale of FGF23. And here are my disclosures. And this is the outline of my talk. We'll talk a little bit about phosphate hemostasis, the role of FGF23, its regulation in uh, synthesis in bone, and then on skeletal effects of FGF23 excess for two examples, one excellent hypothesis and chronic kidney disease. So phosphate hemostasis is uh, kept constant via three organs. It's the intestine, uh, the bone, and the kidney. Usually uh, the resorption and formation uh, of phosphorus from the, in the bone is uh, a natural zero balance, at least in adults and children, of course, we have a, a positive formation in the end. And about 900 milligram of phosphate are getting reabsorbed and excreted, uh, uh, absorbed by the uh, intestine and excreted uh, by the kidney. Um, less than 1% of phosphate is in the bone, in, in the circulation, so the major content is uh, about 85% of phosphate is in the bone. This is highly regulated uh, by active vitamin D, PTH and uh, FGF23 and IGF1. Uh, Calcitrol increases the phosphate absorption from the gut, whereas PTH um, uh, increases the resorption and 125 its formation. And within the kidney, we have the phosphaturic hormone PDH and FGF23, whereas IGF1 is a phosphate conserving hormone, which makes sense because it's related to, to growth hormone and growth. So looking to the kidney, um, we have, uh, this is regulated by PTH, FGF23 and IGF1, of, in addition to also serum phosphorus, for, for phosphate is uh, freely uh, filtered in the glomerulus and highly reabsorbed by about 70% the proximal tubule by two transporters. It's a sodium dependent uh, phosphate transporter NAPI2A and 2C. And uh, in the end, about less than five up to 20%, depending on the demands of the body of phosphate are getting uh, excreted. FGF23 is uh, um, uh, mainly produced in osteocytes, but also in other cell sources, in osteoblasts, bone marrow, or in cardiac myocytes. And the um, protein is uh, uh, highly glycosylized in the Golgi apparatus. It has a molecular weight of 32 kilogram. It has a C-terminus part and an N-terminus part. The C-terminus part is uh, responsible for clothal binding. That's the obligate code a receptor of FJ23, and the N-terminus is responsible for binding to the FGF receptors. So in, within the kidney, it activates FGF receptor 1 and downstream signaling cascade, which results in a downregulation of the NARP2A and NARP2C co-transporter and then phosphate uh, wasting, that means uh, uh, resulting in reduced phosphate levels. In addition, it is a major regulator of uh, active vitamin D. This is done by two um, mechanisms. First, it reduces the synthesis of uh, uh, the 1-alpha hydroxylase and enhances the 24-hydroxylate, which is in the end results in low active vitamin D. Um, the uh, FGF23 synthesis is highly regulated by post-translational modifications, and this takes place at the pro uh, protein convertase cleavage site, which uh, is responsible to degradate uh, FGF23 into a, a, a C-terminus uh, um, uh, FGF23 so that it's inactivated and this can be stabilized by o, uh, o glycosylation We are GAL3. By doing this, there's more intact FGF23 in the blood, so we have a higher FGF23 activity. So we could talk a little bit about the clotho, uh, clotho which is the obligate co-receptor. It's membrane-bound protein, ma uh, major present in uh, the kidney, but also in parathyroid gland and bone. Um, um, Clotho binds FGF23 together with FGF1, 2, and 3 in the complex, which leads to an activating of these uh, receptors. However, there's also um, an, a soluble form of Clotho available in the blood, 
which is uh, mainly produced in the kidney by um, um, a cleavage of uh, the extracellular part of the uh, alpha cloto, which results in alpha cloto ecto, or we call it also soluble cloto, which, uh, and there is uh, increased evidence, uh, also acts as a portable code receptor of FGHRN3. So how does it work in life? So we have a, a, a phosphate-rich meal, which synthesis increases the synthesis of FGF23, and then uh, it impairs vitamin D synthesis, which reduces the phosphate reabsorption from the gut. In addition, the NAPRI uh, uh, transporters get downregulated, so we have a reduced phosphate reabsorption. And in addition, phosphate also stim stimulates the other phosphatuic hormone, is uh, PTH, and we get, in the end, at um, lower phosphate levels, which makes sense. We uh, too much phosphate intake, and then we, uh, we uh, enhance the phosphate excretion via the kidney. There's always a feedback regulation. So FGF23 secretion results also in a negative feedback loop via PTH and active vitamin D. So the question uh, which was recently answered is, how does bone cells sense phosphate in order to synthesize the right amount of FGF23? And this seminal paper from Takashi et al was just published in PNS 2019, and I just show you a cartoon on that. So phosphate, this is the osteoblast, the osteocyte, and phosphate enters the uh, osteocyte by so far poorly understood mechanism. It's, high, it's, it's most like the pit one and two, and it activates the unliganded F receptor one, which results in phosphorylation and activation of downstream signaling, which results in the nucleus of enhanced um, transcription of GAN23, uh, which I just shown you, uh, results in enhanced oclic oscillation at the cleavage side, which in the end results in a more, um, more active um, intact uh, FGF23, and, uh, and the, this is the story. Um, interestingly, FGF23 is not uh, expressed in all bone cells. It's only expressed in the early stages uh, of osteocytes, which you can see here, the study by the co-staining with FGF23 in red, together with the osteocyte marker E11, and you see the yellow staining. So it's only expressed in early stages, and we so far don't know why. So it has something probably to do with bone development. But it's not only phosphate which regulates the uh, synthesis of FGH23, it's a highly regulated complex uh, process. First of all, the transcription uh, is regulated by genes like the PEX gene, uh, DNP1 or ENP1, which if they are mutated result in hypophosphatemic rickets, they all have, if they are functioning, a suppressive action on the transcription of FGH23. In addition, as I told you just before, there's post-translation post -translation and modification like GAN3, which stabilizes uh, the protein, and there are furins which are responsible for, for cleavage. And then in uh, addition to phosphate, which is uh, the major regulator, we have other factors like cloto deficiency, iron deficiency, activated renin angiotensin system, and uh, calcitriol and calcium, which are all stimulators of FGH23 transcription. So how does it work now in XLH? XLH uh, is due to mutations in the PEX gene, resulting in enhanced synthesis of FGH23, like in other forms of autosomal recessive um, and dominant uh, uh, renal phosphate wasting disorders. Uh, increased synthesis of FGH23 results in, in increased circulating FGH23, which results in the kidney um, when down regulation of the NAPI, uh, receptor, uh, NAPI transporters and then low phosphate levels. This is uh, also um, fostered 
by the actions of uh, FGA trend three on uh, the 125 synthesis, which uh, suppresses 125 synthesis, which also reduces which uh, the phosphate reabsorption by, uh, by the gut, and in the end by uh, results in impaired availability of directly phosphate. This altogether results in low phosphate levels and low phosphate levels in the end, if it's long standing, results in rickets and osteomalacia. So this is uh, due to the effect that uh, hypophosphatemia results in impaired terminal differentiation of uh, the chondrocytes, which we call apoptosis, and impaired mineralization, which is in the end rickets, and impaired mineralization of bone we call osteomalacia. However, we have a rather complex phenotype in patients with exolate. We have not just uh, the rickets, patients have um, changes in the bone skull morphology, they have cranial stenostosis and they have frontal bossing, they have uh, dental abscess, they have dyspropionate fraud stature. So is it all secondary to rickets? What is it all about? Are there direct effects of FDA trinity? Yes, there's increased evidence, at least for some parts of this phenotype are clearly explained by direct actions of FDA trinity on the skeletal. First of all, FGF23 suppresses the chondrocyte proliferations in the presence of the soluble cloto, both in retro and in vivo, by activation of FGF receptor 3. And this is done by inhibition of the Indian hedgehog pathway. So FGF23 directly um, impairs chondrocyte proliferation. In addition, there's evidence that FGF23 uh, FG excess may activate F receptor 3 in fibrocartilage cells, and this may cause the calcification in these patients, which we call antisopathy. Um, patients with XLH are prone to development of chronosynostosis, which is a, a major clinical problem. And we know that activating mutations of F receptor 2 and 3 are known to cause chronosynostosis. So the hypothesis that FGF3 may stimulate FGF receptor 2 and 3 in cranial sutures in XLH patient, which results in a premature uh, suture of the uh, um, uh, this, uh, cranial suture and uh, thereby to cranial synostosis. The hearing loss uh, is also uh, noted in adolescent patients, but mainly in adult patients with XLH. So there are uh, several hypotheses. First of all, that FGF3 results in a temporal bone malformation, similar to that what we see called rickets or osteomalacia. And the second is that FGF3 increases the synthesis of cytokines, which results in autodysmedia and endolymphatic hydrops. And finally, by so far poorly understood uh, mechanism, there's an accumulation of uh, glycoproteins, which also are thought to promote endolymphatic hydrops, which is a characteristic hallmark of um, um, hearing loss in XLH. So there are several uh, direct actions of FGN3 uh, on, on the skeletal. Now we're coming to an even more complex scenario. It's the uh, autosomal dominant inherited form of uh, hypophosphatemic rickets, which often manifest in adolescent age, especially in females with iron deficiency. And I would like to explain you why this um, happens in rather higher age uh, than compared to um, patients with axial age. First of all, the effects of iron deficiency or inflammation on the um, uh, transcription and cleavage of um, FGF23. So iron deficiency results in enhanced transcriptions and also enhanced cleavage. So at the, in the end, there's a little bit more uh, FGF23 total. There's a little bit uh, um, uh, intact FGF around, but in the end, it's not so much IGF1 around. So they are usually, this is balanced. In patients with autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets, they have a problem with the cleavage. So there's um, a reduced cleavage in, in, in the end. So that means that we have um, less uh, um, total FGF3 and more intact FGF3, which has results in a higher ratio. However, the total amount of IGF 
intact IGF-1, uh, intact FGF-3 is rather low. So in the end, the patients are not much diseased. But if they get the second hit, um, that if they have a, a iron deficiency, uh, then we have the combination of enhanced uh, synthesis of FGF-3 and reduced cleavage. And this results in an increased ratio, but also in higher levels of intact FGN3, which results in phosphate wasting and rickets. So that's the two hit model of autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets. Now we are coming to the second uh, pathophysiological uh, phenomenon uh, in, in chronic kidney disease. So in chronic kidney disease, the first detectable parameter in, in the blood is uh, elevation of FGF23, which also which already takes place at CKD stages two and, and, and three. And we are not quite sure why it happens, but there's evidence that it's increased phosphate load and also inflammation, which results uh, uh, which is important for the body because in uh, patients with uh, decreasing GFR, we have an increased phosphate load and phosphate is a vascular toxin. So it makes sense that the body tries to get rid of it to keep the phosphate balance stable. But as always in life, uh, pay, uh, we have to pay a price for that. This results in the end in lower 125 levels and a tendency for hypocalcemia, which together with the increased phosphate load with advanced CKD stimulates PTH. And then we got the whole concert of what we call previously renal osteodystrophy with secondary hypothyroidism. Uh, this is the first price we have to pay. The second price, we will hear a, a lot more about to, uh, this about today, is left ventricular hypertrophy. In addition to that, we have a decreased expression of the membrane-bound cloto and also uh, of the levels of soluble cloto in patients with CKD and also in animal models, which also results potentially in an FGF23 um, resistance. So FJ23 is up, Cloto is down. So the question is, who is first? So um, the FJ23 excess or Cloto deficiency? What came first, the chicken or the egg? So um, the first uh, hypothesis is that we have a primary Cloto deficiency, which is shown here, and then we have a secondary increase in FGF23 due to tubular resistance of FGF23. But this is rather unlikely because there's hard evidence in studies from children and adults with early CKD that they don't have uh, show alterations of mineral metabolism attributable to cloto deficiency, for example, elevated phosphate, calcium, or active vitamin D, but they show rather decreased phosphate level, which strongly argues uh, against uh, a primary cloto deficiency. On the other hand, uh, patients with early CKD show clearly elevated FGF23 levels and uh, renal phosphate wasting and also some, at, at least in early CKD, decreased phosphate levels, which uh, may cause in the long term a secondary downregulation of clothal expression, or this may also be a consequence of inflammation. In addition to these rather indirect effects of phosphate on, on, on the bone and, and renal osteodystrophy, there's evidence that um, FGF23 interacts with another important bone protein, sclerostein, and this results in inhibiting inhi inhibition of the beta cadenin pathway because sclerostein and FGF23 acts in the end as a wind pathway inhibitor. This is uh, nicely shown in this cartoon. So sclerostein is stimulated in early CKD, which is a wind pathway inhibitor, which is usually um, suppressed at later stages by increasing levels of PTH. However, PTH in the presence of soluble clotho activates uh, an, a beta cadenine uh, 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 inhibitor, the decop related protein one, which again results in the wind pathway inhibition. So sclerostein in later stages, also FDF23, uh, also have direct effects of, uh, of, um, on the bone, which may be explained um, uh, to early bone loss in CKD patients. 
Inflammation is an important regulator of FJ23 regulation by uh, several mechanisms. The most important is the enhanced synthesis of hepcidine, which results in, in the liver, which results in the end in the functional iron deficiency and in, uh, increased uh, uh, transcription of HF1, which is a strong stimulator of FJ23 production. In addition, there are cofactors like iron deficiency, which results in stabilization of HIF1 alpha, which is in the in the end also contributing to the effects of FGF of inflammation uh, to the uh, FGF twenty three excess. So inflammation, why HIF1, which is uh, exaggerated by uh, iron deficiency, results in enhanced FGF twenty three production, which is widespread in patients with CKD. In addition, um, uh, the group from uh, Christian Faul uh, showed, nicely showed in animal experience uh, that um, FGF 23 by itself uh, promotes inflammation, uh, which is done by a binding of FGF 23 in the FGF, to the FGF receptor 4 in the liver which by, it has the same pathway as we know from the development of cardiac hypertrophy via FGF23, results in activation of the calcineurin and fat pathway, which results in the activation of genes regulation in regulating inflammatory cytokine production, which results in increased production of CRP and interleukin-6, which results in a positive feedback in enhanced CMFGF23. So there's a vicious circle between elevated FGF 23 and inflammation. Both are present in patients with CKD. Finally, there's a nice study just published last year from Kerbin et al, which uh, uh, give evidence that there's a kidney bone crosstalk with respect to the deleterious effects of FGF 23 in the setting of CKD. So kidney injury uh, results in increased synthesis of lipocaline 2 in, in animals, which is the marine homologue of NGAL. And there are clinical studies showing that NGAL uh, uh, levels are associated after 23 levels independent of kidney function in CKD patients. So in this study, it was shown that in, uh, in uh, kidney models and in cell culture models, that uh, kidney injury results in enhanced lipocaline 2 secretion in the kidney, and lipocaline directly stimulates FGF23 synthesis in bone. And in the animal models, they use the collagen 4A3 knockout mice. Um, the animal models, not unexpected, show uh, cardiac hypertrophy via calcineurin and fat pathway uh, activation. So what they did, they used not only wild type animals, but they used also lipocaline to knock out animals. And in these animals, the whole phenotype, cardiac phenotype was blocked. So there was uh, less in, uh, FGF transthesis in bone in these animals, and there was no cardiac phenotype, giving strong evidence for kidney bone heart crosstalk in CKD, which is me mediated by lipocaline 2. To sum this up, FGF23 is a major regulator of phosphate hemostasis. The FGF23 expression and bioelectric activity is highly regulated by hormones, for example, PEX and DMP1, by trust lens relation modification, coreceptor clotho, and one important factor is phosphate, calcium 125, and PDH, that there are cofactors like iron status and availability inflammation and, uh, and renin and content system. In addition, all FGL 3 by itself also promotes inf uh, inflammation in view of a vicious circle. So the excess, uh, FGL 3 excess in, in CKD is multifactorial. We have the phosphate load, we have inflammation, we have iron deficiency and many other factors and uh, there's also new evidence, but strong evidence that, that there's a kidney, bone, heart crosstalk. That means that kidney injury, uh, injury directly stimulates FGF23 synthesis in bone via lipocaline 2. So in the setting of FGF23 excess, uh, we have a different pathophysiological setting. First, in uh, the setting of 
in uh, clotho sufficient subjects with normal kidney function, like an XLH, this results in rickets or stimulation and cranicinostosis. In the setting of CKD, where um, we have usually clotho um, deficiency and other core factors, um, we have an enhanced uh, um, expression of sclerostein together with uh, FGA23, which are thought to contribute to early bone loss. And we have the deleterious effects on the long term on the bone, which we call rostodystrophy or CKD MBD. And uh, in the end, uh, we will talk, we will hear about more in the, in the next uh, talks. Uh, FGA23 appears as a therapeutic target in conditions of inherited or acquired FGA23 excess, which is quite tricky. For XLH, is quite clear, but in CKD, uh, it's a very tricky process. And having said this, I would like to thank you for your attention and 